Hi, Adam. How you doing? Awesome. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. And um, thank you so much for coming over to like this TKYT session for us to talk some CSS wizardry. Um, I'm a big fan of everything you've done and showed us <laughs> um, about CSS. Like, I, I think I've known you for like maybe three, four years on the internet and everything you do, you know, from Firebug and every other thing. So, yeah. Um, for those who don't know you already in the web dev space, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us who you are. And most importantly, a fun fact about you when you wrap up. Sure. Uh, I'm a nerd, y'all. I uh, love this web stuff. It's like invaded my my like personality so much i just see things in real life as web dev problem problems all the time it's just dumb like i'll be working on the house and i'll be like oh this is just like this api oh this is <laughs> i'll be interacting with a person and be like oh this is just like a pseudo selector uh just kidding but not really uh anyway i'm very very much um obsessed with all this i work at google mm -hmm. i'm on the chrome team i focus on css and ui we want to make sure that it's easy to build beautiful engaging accessible uh, experiences on the web. And I feel like we've been uh, really attacking this strong for the past few years. That's probably where you know me from as I, I jumped yeah. in on the Chrome DevRel team and started focusing on this. I'm a member of the working group. I have various open source libraries. I just basically I'm a crafter. I code all day, <laughs> every day. I just love it. Um, and I'm happy to be here chatting about, you know, just building stuff, making things look cool or be pretty or just be weird. I like weird things too. Uh, mm. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Ah, uh, also, oh, see, I guess you need that... a weird fact though. Yeah, I think the, the, give us a weird fact. Is it like being weird and all? Uh, let's see, weird fact. Um, I used to be a cheer guy. Oh, okay. So it's just I was on the cheer squad. We, you know, we we're dancing, <laughs> making sure Ooh, you're that's... having good vibes at the game. <laughs> yeah, that's... actually. Might not be surprising that a DevRel was once a cheerleader. I suppose the 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 role is oh snap, yeah. dude, it's super similar. <laughs> oh yeah. You're cheerleading for your product and for your ability to get people excited about it, you know. I think it's the same standards, yeah. standards, the, rah rah rah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um so thank you for that amazing <laughs> Amazing intro. I'm sorry for that, actually. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I'm not sorry at all. It, 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 it was amazing, yeah. We should all devour like that, you know. Go with the placards and, you know. <laughs> yeah, toe touches. Yeah, let's do a backflip before we go. New API. Backflip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that will be fun. So, um, really, I think we should get started with the most important question of them all. And, um, yeah. Is CSS a programming language? No, this one's easy. It is, it's not. No, it's not. It's not like any, you, you don't put characters in a file. The file doesn't get read by anything and turned into something else. You know, it's not like there's functions. There's no types. Uh, it's just, if you can, if you can say color red, and you can write CSS. And so it's so easy. It's not real. It's not a real programming language. Um, I'm just kidding. Of course, it's a programming language. <laughs> I mean, I think what people really want to distinguish sometimes when they, I don't know what they're trying to do. Anyway, they're like, it's not scripting. I'm like, all right. Uh, okay. So wait, if you're in React where it's de declarative or I don't know, I just, it just seems so weird. The, the lines that people have, like they'll write a SQL query which is declarative, uh, mm -hmm. which is just like a selector in CSS. You're just selecting from a big data object. Uh, for some reason, if you do that in SQL, you're a programmer. But if you write a really cool CSS selector, uh, you're not. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, oh, make, yeah. I hope it makes someone feel good that they that they think they're better. I don't know. I think I think <laughs> just a lot of double standards, really. And I feel like... I don't know if it's a thing of pride or, you know, I, I know Java, I'm a real programmer. You write CSS, Adam, you're not a real programmer at all. You know, I, I just don't get it. I don't know what's happening. But at the end of the day, um, programming is telling the computer what to do, right? So if you're telling the computer what to do with CSS, in my book, it's a, it's a programming language. No matter how the DSL looks, 
I don't know. And we could do a lot with CSS, which is part of the reason why you're here, because I've been seeing the wonder CSS is doing. And for me, I'm personally happy. Though I don't have to write CSS these days with like um the dot CSS files. I use Tailwind because I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So meta, meta but, CSS. <laughs> exactly. See, see, I'm a meta programmer doing Tailwind stuff. We and... all are. That's the that's the whole point here. If you're not <laughs> yes. writing ones and zeros by hand, you're not a real programmer. You're just really? writing in a in a in an easy to use language for humans, which means you're not as cool as the machine. Be a robot. Uh-huh. Then you can be the best programmer ever. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, I I just went <laughs> in, in my head. I was thinking how the life would be moving our rectangles with ones and zeros. So no, come back, come back. I'm I'm back now. So so, so for you, um, I there are a lot of things we could nerd on on software development, and I know you work on the Chrome team, so. What was it for you? Chrome before CSS or CSS before Chrome? Like, what did you fall in love with first? And I've seen a lot of crazy things that can be done with CSS. Of course, from your side of the internet, it's just amazing. But what was it for you? Was it Chrome that got you interested in CSS? Because you work on the CSS part of Chrome and the world, your browser rendering thing of the styling we put out there. Or was it CSS before that? It was uh, front end before that. So like when I was in school, okay. um, I studied Java and PHP and um, and then Flash. And what was interesting for me is when we once we got to Flash and even a little bit in Java, most students uh, were happy just um, with the result of their function printing in the console. And so they're like, mm-hmm. aha, all of my Java works. There it is in the console. And I was like, yes. yeah, but we can do better. You know, you can make it look, you can co- make it colorful, make it more mm-hmm. readable. You could make a little table. You know, like, ooh, present the data in a nice little shape. And then we got into yep. Flash. And when I started Flash, I was playing a lot of Guitar Hero. And Guitar Hero has a really had a really cool, like, animated UI for back in the day. It was, like, very advanced. Um, and so I wanted to re- rec- recreate a lot of that. And in Flash, oh. I remember one time uh, every, we were building a button. It was, like, make a button, play a timeline. And so everyone had, like, a button and, like, a really slow airplane came in. Uh, and I was like, man, y'all are making Flash look really lame. And you clicked my button and I shot in like 50 rock hands that all bounced with like a springy animation. Yep, and it was just cool. like, yeah, it was way cooler. Yeah. And I was like, I think yeah. I'm uh, I'm a little different from everyone else. Uh, and so after I graduated from programming, like 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 hardcore back end. And mm-hmm. anyway, I went to a design school and then I got a job oh. in the field. So I was working as a front end engineer while I was in design school, while I was building other designers' designs. Oh. And I just fell in love with uh, the user end of things, like the, the way things feel. Like everyone talks about iPhone versus Android and the way things feel, right? They're like, it just mm-hmm. feels different, you know, or whatever. Um, and I, was, yeah, yeah. I just started obsessing over those things. And so for me, it was CSS first. I liked being the one you could lean on to make a really high polished, gorgeous UI, you know, um, not the one that you could, I, although I was way into frameworks back in the day so really like my history is i'm very much a framework javascript engineer that got Mm -hmm. so infatuated and focused on high fidelity front ends um, that i started curating that and cultivating it heavily and when i joined google i joined as a a cloud uh, on google cloud a ux engineer on the design systems team eventually made it onto the chrome team and when i was joining the chrome team i was like hey i've been watching paul lewis you guys have some really great devrel that do ui stuff but no one's like focused on CSS. You got like five people on JavaScript and there's no one on CSS. You should have someone just focus on CSS teaching on Chrome. And they were like, cool, you do it. And I was like, no, I I don't have a, I'm not an influencer. I'm not, I don't have follower. I don't have any of that stuff. Uh, And they encouraged me to do it. And I have been doing it ever since. Um, And so kind of stepped into the role I was hoping someone else would do. And then they were like, well, you have opinions about it, so you should do it. And I was like, oh, crap, I do have opinions. So CSS first, uh, then Chrome. So like I kind of followed my love all the way through uh, to here. Now I get to help shape the language, uh, being a part of the working group, listening to people. It's huge. Um, So yeah, that's a a long-winded history. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, I I like the history. That was fun, really. Um, You know, I feel like if you tell me to do what you do, I'm going to suck at it, really, because I like CSS, 
but I don't like CSS. You know, I, I like you know, like it's not something I want to be like. You know what? I'm gonna do this for like today. I'm just gonna read all the CSS properties out there and know what like all the values <laughs> I can get. No, not. I don't even think I know all the sizing units really. Like I just know that I pixels and the EMs. Like, I don't. Can you even tell me what I, I? You tell me to tell you what the difference between RAM and EMs are. I'm just gonna flop. Because I just try whichever no. one works. <laughs> no worries. Right? Yeah, no big deal. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, I think your your interest for CSS, like d- designing stuff or styling stuff with CSS, sort of like made you this, I'm just going to use the word CSS influencer that you are. Oh, yes, CSS influencer. If not on your bio, you better add it. So because I think <laughs> it... <laughs> A lot of the cool things I've seen being added onto CSS, I think I've seen from your from your part of the internet. And it's just been really, really good. So speaking of which, you know, back in the day, right? I think the the folks who still think CSS is not a programming language, they still do. They were like, you know what? We have a better idea. Let's pre-process CSS, you know, give it variables, give it functions, you know, give it some nesting and all that jazz. And it was the days of preprocessors, right? Like um, SAS and LES and all that jazz. And for you, I think you've been in CSS long enough to like, you know, also see the heydays of the preprocessor. What Do you really like the stuff? Do you like the problem they were solving? How... How was it for you? Because I think you're sort of like a CSS purist because you like writing CSS. Like, did that really rub off on you as this is really, really good and teams need it or not? Yes. So I do remember when there was no preprocessors and then when the first one showed up, which I believe was less, uh, and less had variables. That was, that was huge uh, yeah. because we were doing so much repeating of values uh, and then your style sheet. So it's like right as less came out, at least for me and the team I was on, we were starting to build iPad one apps uh, and our apps became really complicated as we were trying to recreate the things that native apps were doing with HTML and CSS back then. And so uh, variables was really important for helping us stay dry and staying connected as a team. Um, and I jumped on a lot of these preprocessors. I've used all of them. In fact, my favorite is still stylus, um, oh. but I'm like a weirdo where I don't want to type very much at all. Like I'm down with white space, delimited text. I'm down with dropping all the curlies, all the semicolons, all the colons, just all the junk. I'm like, get rid of it. Oh, no. Stylus was just like straight up. It was very JavaScripty. It was like JavaScript making style sheets in a, like a coffee script. It was like coffee script uh, for styles. Anyway, styles was super cool. These things mm-hmm. were very very meaningful. And they've been very impactful over the past like 10, 15 years as we've seen the CSS language adopt a lot of the great ideas out of there, right? Now we have nesting inside of CSS. Uh, We have variables that are like nearly uh, real time. They're almost like a reactive property that you get inside of like like an observable, but they're a little bit different than that. Um, And yeah, I was definitely in on those. I've uh, even used Tailwind lots of times. There's, I've used like every framework, every JavaScript framework. I've used like every UI library. I like to try these things out to give me perspective at like, where are people thinking? Uh, what are the problem spaces that they're working on? Um, but yeah, for me, the end goal is always just like, what did I make and how did it feel? Did it feel good? Um, and did the framework and the tooling help me deliver that good experience? Um, and just what were the trade-offs? But yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the good experience with what we had with the less i never touched stylus I, I i saw it but i didn't even care enough to look i was just i think the one i used mostly was sas mm-hmm. and um so i think one of the thing is for teams maintainability and because you could do variables it was just amazing because you could just like you know not get to copy and paste and all the color could be off by some by some things because someone copied it and you know it, it just gets really really chaotic so um but i think we are in a good space in css land right and that's the whole topic for this conversation where i think it's just like jquery what jquery did for javascript because for me jquery sort of made javascript select dom selection amazing because it really really sucked with the document or get element by id and the things and that that but now we have query selector which takes any css selector which is all thanks to jQuery. So 
I think that's what pre processors are doing for us. It gave us um um custom properties, which is our versions of variables, right? And mm-hmm. I think you you are the expert. Why don't we? Why didn't we call it call them variables? Why Why did we have to go with custom properties? Something that's been bugging me, and I'd be like, you know what? When I see this expert, I'm going to ask why. Yes, um, I think it's because the way that you define them, and then the way that you use them, and the way that they inherit is much closer to like the way that color has a value of red. Color being mm-hmm. the property, red being the value. And when you define a custom property, you define it like a property and value. So it's like a dash, dash, color, colon, red. And now mm-hmm. uh, you have this portable sort of mm-hmm. um, property that does hold a value, but that property can be updated. And that property kind of trickles down the cascade a lot like um, another property would. So I think that's why they're that way. Yeah, um, custom properties. That's kind of a fun, fun question. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right? Is it? I don't I know. know. Right, <laughs> I I probably have a couple of those on my sleeve as we go, but yeah, that's clear. So you all, that's why it's called custom properties, not variables, because you know, like from the like from the outside, as like us, we'll be like, wasn't that what um, SAS and Liz were doing for us? Why not just variables? Why are you creating your own terms? Just call them variables. But it 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 does make a lot of sense because you know it's still in the declaration block where you give the the property then the value. Because CS is all properties and values, right? But now you're creating your own custom properties and then you could use them. See, I'm yep. slowly becoming And you got to have a scope form. And... Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you desire it, so shall you achieve. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I'm tapping in CSS anointing. So yeah, let's go into why we don't need CSS preprocessors today. So I'm going to just start with this. Are you saying that in terms of completion, everything that was very enticing with preprocessors now exists natively in CSS and all the browsers support them. Yeah, very important. Let's let's chat about the delta between, yeah, where, yes. what are your preprocessors doing for you now and where is mm-hmm. it stable in browsers? So um, my personal website is a great example to go to. It's nerdy.dev. You'll see that I'm using cascade layers. I've shipped native nesting, um, all sorts of really, really modern goodies in there are in there and they're not pre-processed away. I can also do that on my site because it's my site and it can be an experimental thing. Maybe your production site can't, but nesting is everywhere. There is um, some things aren't available yet, but are in like our spec or getting worked on. Like one of them is custom functions. And that's mm-hmm. different from a mixin. So okay. uh, both of those are ideas. You, we probably won't get loops in CSS, okay. but there is a spec that I proposed called sibling index, which can give you access to the um, index of a child. So you'd be like, mm-hmm. oh, I have 10 siblings. You know, my family's 10 big. Here's my parent element. Which number am I in this set of 10? And you could get access to that, which is often what loops are done for. Um, except for cases where they generate a bunch of stuff. And then one of the last things too that you can't do, uh, well, at least that I use a preprocessor mm-hmm. for, is for bundling. So I've got all my imports at the top of a style sheet and I like to deliver one style sheet. Mm-hmm. So that way that's only one request as opposed to delivering a style sheet that included all the imports mm. um, and did that. So bundlers are important in that. And then I also use cascade layers on my imports. So the bundler needs to take the import bundle it into the layer as I defined it and make a big single file out of it. Um, yeah. But the layers make it nice so I don't have to maintain order. I defined my order in the layers and then I just sort of let the bundlers go, you know, squish it all together. Yeah. In one big file. Ooh. Hmm. So, I don't know. I think I sort of missed the memo. Yeah. So, you have to correct me if I'm wrong here on when did we get imports in CSS? Like, was that always a thing? Oh, it was a while ago. Oh, like... It's been a thing for a long time, yeah. Yeah, because I know I just used them. You know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so so definitely import wasn't a a problem um, our preprocessors were solving. So we have imports down for ages ago. Then we have... um, So we have... So a a little bit um, something that people are skeptical about 
which is nesting. I personally, I think, like I said, I don't write to CSS files. I just use Tailwind. So not not on me. But I I hear you have to um, you have to say if it's true or not that the nesting you get with preprocessors like Less or SAS sort of differ from the CSS nesting. Is that true at all, or is it the same custom properties versus variable thing all over again? It's very similar. There's one big difference these days. So there was all sorts of changes and iterations and the version of nesting that's in all the browsers now is nearly identical to SAS with one big change, which is CSS. This is kind of like variables where CSS is treating the as a property and not a static variable, whereas your SAS and less is they treat variables very statically. And the same thing is happening with your nesting. In nesting with native CSS, you're combining objects together in the selectors. You're not combining strings. So when you're in SAS, you have this ability to like append a string, or you can even generate class names, like right? You can do it on the fly, make yeah. a loop and generate a bunch of them. You can't do that in the nesting spec um, because these things aren't strings. Selectors aren't strings. They're more like a live object, like a typed object. And when you stick them next to each other, they behave as objects next to each other, not as two strings that concatenate. Okay. So one of the biggest differences is if you're a fan of BIM, uh, where you kind of do this like block element modifier, you have any of those uh, sort of naming strategies, and you liked how SAS lets you just sort of append, uh, you know, variants to a selector, yeah. you can't do that in nesting, um, at least not in like single string building, but you can still have compound selectors. Um, but yeah, that's mm. a big difference. Otherwise, yeah, it's that's... almost the same. You can pretty much copy yeah. and paste like your SAS stuff right over. Yeah, I'm pretty sure for a like a greater percentage of users that they, they might not even notice the difference, right? Because when I used it, I didn't really care about objects and strings. I just know that, oh, I'm nesting stuff. It's all organized, right? And I, I'm good. It, it felt good for me. So um, I think at this point, I would want you to like, you know, just give us a little bit of demo of the things, especially in the context of, you know, of preprocessors. I'm going to have like a couple of features i'm going to throw at you are you going to tell me if we have it in css or not because of course we have to put Sweet. CSS to the test yeah <laughs> yeah so are you ready um you could so um you're going to share your screen and i you will be yeah you want me to like live demo something let's do it yeah yeah you could just share us your screen in a bit um All right, here we go. Sharing a yeah. brand new uh, Do it. code pen. Ooh, yummy. Code pen, it's been a while. And I think this is your this is your forge, your CSS forge, because you could just easily put this <laughs> up, give us a link, and we go, wow, how did he do that? Of course, just... Some good old real-time stuff in here, yep. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. we got already an example here with the at layer, which is in SAS, you have the concept of layers. Um, and now mm -hmm. they're in they're stable in every browser. So I like these because I can put all my styles down here in demo support. And you know that mm -hmm. if you're looking at the the demo, that I'll put all the demo code in the demo section and you can be like, ah, now I can focus mm -hmm. on what made this effect cool. Yeah. Cool. That's fun. So hold up a little bit. Um just for like for us CSS noobs, what does the layer do again? Yeah. Okay. So a layer is like um <laughs> Before we had cascade layers, everything was in one layer and you had to mm -hmm. really manage how your styles loaded because of that. Okay. And so this would always be like, you'd have like a uh, index.stylesheet or master.stylesheet or whatever it was. It had many names over the years, but like something that loaded everything in a very specific oh. order. And you were like, no, bootstrap has to come through first. You know, Tailwind has to come first or Tailwind even asks you to put things in layers these days, but it uses post CSS layers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the concept of layering is more like uh, you're thinking ahead at how the override strategy of your styles is going to work. And and it, it works in a way that isn't like selector specificity drawn. It's drawn from the stack of layers in terms of like priority that you have. So a layer uh, above a different layer 
will have its styles applied before the other layer. So you can think, okay. we usually do this where like, you think about like, here's my base styles. Here's my normalize and my reset. Here's my third party libraries. Uh, here's my utility functions. And finally, here's our custom styles for this application. Yeah. And yes. those were like four or five uh, mentalities in terms of like structure, but you can actually turn mm. those into layers and beyond just like naming them, which is kind of nice, they leave a little bit of a breadcrumb about the purpose of a style. Um, yeah. You can then load anything asynchronous. So you don't have to worry about load order anymore because since the layers mm. are defined, as the styles come in, they go, hey, this group of styles is part of layer one. And it goes boop up into layer one. And you say, hey, layer two styles. I know they loaded 10 seconds later, but here, stick them in layer three. And so you can nice. have a really great control over the override um, kind of passes that happen on your application uh, in terms of layers. And it just, mm. yeah, it takes that big style sheet that couldn't be changed and makes it so that it can be changed and that styles can load uh, when they need to, as opposed to when you needed to, them to, just so they built correctly. Oh, nice. We, see, like, I think I probably would have to just in a project do some CSS.CSS offering because I'm missing out on these goodies because Tailwind just makes me spoiled and all that stuff. So I, I, I never get to use all this. But it's fun, really. Okay. All right. Now. Yeah, there's there's three layers. Yeah. Kelvin is a layer. So is Adam. And you're is the layer. most important one. <laughs> oh, 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 wow. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. Um. So, let's keep going. Let's talk about... Um, yeah, nesting, right? Let's see Let's nesting. nesting. Okay, so yeah, yeah, here's here's our main tag or Amina, our main tag, mm -hmm. which Amina's is uh, I just put like a main element and h1 and a paragraph and some HTML mm -hmm. there. And I'll say max and line size is 50 characters. No, and so yeah. now I want to target that paragraph. I could just say direct descendant paragraph is line height. 1.5. Oh. And there's some wow. nesting. And we've already saved some characters. So if you deliver, mm -hmm. if you serve up the, the nesting, so like a difference from preprocessors is they take all your nesting and then they turn it back into long of course. selectors. Mm -hmm. uh, with this nesting, you can deliver sm smaller style sheets, uh, sometimes up to 25% smaller, all wow. because uh, you don't have yeah, to repeat right? that selector over and over. Nice. That's fun. And, you know, Again, noob questions. I think you use two things that I don't know what's up with them. What does max inline size do? And what does what is that new CH unit for sizing? Nice. Yes, I will share. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so the first one that you asked about is max inline size. It's like mm -hmm. max width, except mm -hmm. inline oh, yeah. size is a way to talk about. Uh, it's a way to talk about. Uh, it's not really width. It's it's. Uh, What's the best way to describe this? Okay, like around the world, every mm -hmm. document doesn't look like an American document. Yep. Sometimes they write from right to left. Sometimes they write from top to bottom, right to left. And so there's two different concepts in writing. One of them is when you're putting letters and words after each other, there's a direction. And then when you have enough words together and you want to start a new sentence, those start on a new line. And yeah. so you have inline and block. Inline is as you're writing letters next to each other, and block is as you're stacking the paragraphs next to each other. Or if you're in like a vertical right to left, they'd be stacking side by side. Hmm. Um, these are clutch to use. These are part of the logical properties of CSS where we learned over time that referencing a box by its left or its right or its width or its height, these are what we call physical properties now. And they're very... Um, uh, rigid in that they, they're exactly as they look. But what we need in CSS when we're dealing with right to left languages or vertical right to left or anything that we want to be an internationally consumable document, we have to be more considerate about directionality and not be physical. Uh, and so we were given logical properties from CSS and these let us write a width. So if I say max in line size here, that's gonna be the equivalent of max width in like a Latin language, like English. Um, but if you switch to another writing mode, that will be appropriate for whatever. So basically, I get to size something once, and it works in any language. Yeah. Um, cool. And so max inline size is like max width, inline being the direction that the letters go. Nice. That's magical. That's some really good it's CSS. It's really powerful. 
Yeah, like I, 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 I sort of like just get the because most times when we when we style stuff, we don't really, I don't really focus more on how the reading mode. I, I just, I just do for English, but like with this, I get to like at least get the basics right. Yeah, it's kind of like when you're building a site uh, and uh, you haven't studied any accessibility yet. You'll just accidentally be making one for yourself. You're mm -hmm. right. You're like, well, I don't use the keyboard, so I, I never tested my site with the keyboard. I don't use a screen reader. I didn't test with a screen reader. I don't read in right to left, so I didn't test yeah. my website in right to left. When we talk about responsive these days, responsive is so much more than just a, a variable sized viewport, right? It's very much like we need to adapt to the user. The user, I like to think of it like, the web now is like a really rad car where when you sit down in it, oh. the seat scoots for you. The steering wheel comes down. The whole interior dashboard goes, do you like light or dark? And I'm like, dark. Mm. The dark dashboard shows up, right? And everything just like fits me. I can even bring an accent color and be like, no, this whole car's accent neon lighting is now hot pink. And be like, yes, dark with hot pink. Here you go, sir. Um, Why not? That's what the web is doing. When you visit a web page, we have all these opportunities to have it just automatically match all of your preferences, uh, whether it's the mm. screen size, your reading, writing modes, uh, down to the theme of your operating system. It's super cool. Nice. That's that's amazing. Speaking about responsive, it, is that what the CH is doing for us here? Like, like I thought um, percentage and RAMs and all that helped. So what made the CH so special? I like the CH unit because it represents like the number zero, which is a pretty great average uh, character size. And so a lot of times when I'm like spacing things out, like here from that header to the paragraph, I'm mm -hmm. like that should be about one character, right? It's like, a, otherwise, okay. uh, they're too, otherwise the characters are too close together and then they start to mm -hmm. munge and get kind of, so anyway, it's just a great mm -hmm. unit because it represents uh, also the current font size. So it's kind of like M, except mm -hmm. I always found like M was um, maybe a little too large sometimes because it represents the capital letter M. That's why it's called an M. Um, mm. And then you've got the character unit, which is like the letter zero. So it's slightly smaller than an M. And I just find it to be more reliable. And I like the way that it speaks because I'm like in this terms here, I said max in line size. For, so basically max in line width or max width is 50 characters. So at 50 characters, make a new line. And what we know from studying um, users is that reading lengths really matter. This is like why a book doesn't have wide pages. They're narrow pages, sometimes even into multiple columns. And that's so your eyes don't have to do too much bouncing as it go back. So anyway, we can bake, we can bake UX intelligence right into the max in line size of our content uh, with the character unit. So we're representing mm -hmm. the, the, the intrinsic size of the font and the desired readability for humans to consume that all mm. with one little unit. You could use 50M also. Let's use 50M and see how different it is. Yeah, let's see how that, if there's going to be changes. There you go. Oh, Ooh, it's okay, kind of considerably yeah. bigger, huh? Oh, yeah, it's a it lot is. bigger. Yeah. Oh, Anyway, we'll go back to char. That's interesting. Yeah, that's fun. So okay totally awesome yeah totally so like, that's why i did the uh character <laughs> unit yeah um this has been good so we've we've seen layers right we've seen nesting and you sort of like uh, gave me like a crash course on maximum and size and Some logical units. props yeah yes 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 so i think um I th was it rachel andrews she sort of mentioned a couple of color things, right? And I think all this stuff, what we've, we've mentioned now, they are definitely nesting especially, and the layers, those are the two things of our preprocessors. But I want to go on a tangent a little bit. I, I heard and I saw there are some new colors. Do you want to just go over a couple and tell me what makes them different? Because I just use hexadecimals and ROGBAs and <laughs> HSL is when I'm a CSS nerd, when I want to do nerdy things. So why do we have some more? <laughs> yeah, HSL is the hacker one, right? You're like, ah, okay, I can understand a percentage and I just want to change yeah. a percentage value. So, okay, we have a lot more. We have millions more colors now in CSS, thanks oh, to why? work that was done in 2023. And this mm -hmm. kind of comes down to like, 
I don't know how much you study monitors and displays um, or even your phone, but like, I don't, I didn't really do it much either until I was studying color, but even then I only care like a little bit, but like, for example, when you got an iPad or an iPhone, they said it had a retina display and retina was means. their, it's their clever marketing term for, uh, <laughs> As many colors as your eye can see, they've got it packed into a screen. Oh. And so they're wow. like basically saying when you look at a really vibrant sunset, those colors can be on your screen or whatever. And mm -hmm. so what we've had for ever since the web was created, we had hex and RGB colors, which were the common denominator for screens back in the day. So it's like you get like a million colors with uh, RGB you get a uh, consistency across all these screens and it was powerful that way. It was very por portable. And so we got different ways to access this color. These, these amount of colors that came from the sRGB color space. It's like standard RGB. Anyway, you can think about it like everybody gets a Honda. So when you're, when no. you get a design, uh, when you're looking at a web page or you're looking at everything was in this color space that was very normalized and, and medium and medium good. But now we have more options and not only can they reach for newer, brighter colors because it's not a 25 year old space. We have new screens. These new screens are all like, these are the brightest pixels we've ever shown on any screen. These are the blackest blacks. These are the whitest whites. Look at all these cool things our screens can do. And I was just sitting there like, I don't, I just used hex, you know, like, why do I care? But it turns out. Um, that in order to use the screen that most people have in their hand, right? You've probably got a nice device. Uh, your your Mac is going to have a nice screen built into it. Those, if you use hex colors on those screens, you're immediately in VHS territory versus the colors that you can specify now in 2023 are DVD quality colors. They're more vibrant. It's like it's like you know when you were watching a VHS. I don't know. Did you watch VHS? Sorry if this is like a little lost. I don't think so, but I I, I don't know. Uh, but I do see cas um, cassettes and all that. Is that the same thing? Okay. It's similar. So just like, remember mm -hmm. like a cassette had a certain mm -hmm. sound to it because it was on the tape and then yeah. you got a CD or you got an MP3 and it was like a little more clear. Same thing here with like a VHS. You had like a pretty, you're pretty washed out colors with some, you know, scan mm -hmm. lines here and there. And then when it went to DVD, it's like uh, you were watching, you were listening to cassette tapes and going, I don't need anything better than this. I'm totally hearing the song. The song sounds awesome. And then somebody plays it for you on a CD and like a nice stereo. And you're like, holy crap. Uh, yeah. My cassette is totally not as good. Um, and so that happens with colors. You'll see one yeah. color uh, a website that's in sRGB and you see it next to one that's using these newer color spaces, like a display P3 set of colors. And this is why Apple put those in their iPad and were one of the first people to do these is because they look more beautiful. They're more vibrant. They're more juicy. Everything about it is more dynamic. And so mm. uh, that's what we have with some of these new color spaces. So yeah, if I was to use one right now, I could say, here, let's go to HTML. Uh, and I could see, let's see, what's a good example for, let's do like background color deep pink which is like a very very vibrant yeah. pink in the srgb mm -hmm. color space but now we're going to make one even more bright with oklch okay, let's see if i can even get there let's see so the l is for lightness we're going to do like 75 percent lightness we'll do chroma at like 80 percent and the hue we want it to be like a hot pink which i think is pretty much zero mm -hmm. hey do you see that it barely changed i, I almost perfectly yep. guessed that color yeah so hopefully this comes through in your screen, but if I toggle the different colors on and off, we should see how one is brighter than the other. Oh, okay. There you go. Do you see it? Yeah. Yes, I do. Wow. And on and in person, it's also a lot more vibrant. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost like someone turned it up to 11. So you can think about a lot of these colors, like where you're like, I had really bright neon colors in my hex tool belt. And you're like, well, you can take them next level with this. And then you'll also get more... There's all sorts of advantages to having more colors, uh, like shadows can blend better, gradients can blend better. Um, and then one of the big values of OKLCH that we used here is that OKLCH is kind of like HSL, where we had a hue, a saturation, and a lightness pretty much. But what's cool about OKLCH is the lightness stays the same throughout all of the hues. 
which is mm. not something that HSL does. HSL can kind of wiggle up and down in terms of like vibrance and uh, stuff like that. And OKLCH is a little bit better for building a very dynamic but accessible color palette from. Uh, so it's newer, more reliable, and it can reach into these newer color spaces. So there's a lot that happened in color. Um, and you get to yeah. just dive in at the little pieces here and there that apply for your uh, application. But like another one is gradients. Um, your gradients can look a lot better in this newer space because you can uh, tell it to interpolate, like go from red to blue, but do it not in traditional sRGB, but do it in one of these new ones. These new ones are more mm -hmm. optimized to keep the bright colors together. Mm. Anyway, I could go on about color a lot. So you opened up a can, man. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm regretting that because I'd be like, what colors? The black is black and the white is white. I just see black. I don't, I can't tell the difference. But I, I, I know, I, right? It's so funny. Yeah, yeah. But I think I get the the idea of taking advantage of the whole because, of course, we see the colors through the our monitors and they've gotten really sophisticated and everything so we can let the way we build actually tap into those leverages already and i think that's why all these newer colors sort of shine because you just tap into like all the other things the retina whatever they give to us but that's really really interesting i just so in um i don't know if you do a little bit of adoption check because this one is interesting like I've, how has adoption been? Has, have there been any um, case studies of people moving to this OKLC or are we just all primitive folks using hexadecimals? There's <laughs> definitely been uh, folks adopting it, but it kind of feels like this indie indie movement. It's almost like uh, there's these bands. And these bands are like, there's mm -hmm. a new instrument out. We can have a competitive advantage over top of the other bands because we're using this new uh, instrument. And so you can go to certain websites and these websites know that they used a lime green that can only mm. come from display P3. And they could even probably look at your screen and walk by and be like, ha, they're getting the brand new lime green and they don't even know it. And they could walk by someone else's screen and be like, oh, they're getting old yeah. school lime green because they're not on a new monitor, but the browsers automatically downsize the colors so that it fits within the range of the capabilities of a display. So it's like yeah. that classic CSS thing. I can ask for the brightest color but the browsers and the displays have to come together to show uh, mm. a certain color. But I'd say that like adoption is still pretty low. Like people mm -hmm. are still exploring and figuring out the capabilities of these. I've used them all over my site. You can also upgrade to them. So you can use hex like you are okay. today. And then in certain scenarios, upgrade to one of these if you like, mm. which I do for my neons. So I have like some neon colors on my site. If you go to the dark theme, you'll see these neon colors. Oh. Um, and the, one of the nice. reasons they're so vibrant is because I upgraded the hex from like a deep pink mm -hmm. to a super bright uh, I'm, a hot I'm, pink. I, I, and, I'm yeah. going to your website right now. Let the dev, right? Let's see all yeah, the... Yeah, here I can go there the, too. All the CSS wizardry you've been up to. You share this oh. tab? Okay. So like these little colors in the side here are all display P3. So like that cyan is super here. I don't know if, if you can, can I zoom in? Yeah, I think, okay. Ooh, yeah, like yeah. that CSS is super cyan. This hot pink here, that's orange, this yellow, super mm -hmm. duper bright colors. And if we go into like the code examples, you'll see them here too. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, look at the comma right here is super bold. The cyan is super bold. So I'm using display P3 even on the like code syntax uh, highlights too. So it's, it's subtle, you know, I'm not making the whole background some neon color. I'm subtly bringing it in uh, to different moments in the UI. Yeah, nice. That's that's really good. Like, I, I like how, you know, you could get to experiment with all those things. And, yeah, teach us mortals on how to use them. <laughs> <laughs> there's just a lot it's like es6 when it was coming out there was so mm -hmm. much new stuff happening in javascript it was hard to keep up but after a few years you, you figure mm -hmm. it all out you figure out all the places it's useful and yeah go on your merry way about learning something new awesome that that's dope really so um yeah let's let's segue back into some preprocessors things um yeah one of the things i think sas gives is um, the idea of a partial do we like yeah how do we replicate that in a no 
preprocessor world like how do i like you know use this like use this button style elsewhere so partials and in and inheritance i think we could marry both of them as one topic to talk about how does that work yeah so currently css doesn't have any concept of like at apply or extend mm -hmm. or mixins mm -hmm. which are kind of three different ways that sas would allow you to create a chunk of styles and reason i mean other than we have utility classes right so we can always uh put a group of styles into a class and then use the classes in our html and that's become a very popular way to work but if what you're talking about is like here's a common use case that i have is you're trying to style a like input form element and there's like a special webkit selector and a special uh firefox selector and you can't put the selectors together with a comma because they just, it's just like an old school browser bug. Like one doesn't know how to read the selector, so the whole thing dies. Anyway, so you have to duplicate your styles across these two selectors, and it's super annoying. You're like, I would love a way to basically have partials. Like I want to say, hey, inside of this little selector, absorb the styles from this other section, or, or yeah, place them here just like a partial. There is a proposal by Miriam Suzanne uh, okay. called Mixins in CSS. Uh, it's been proposed. I think it's been accepted in terms of like, yes, we want this inside of CSS, but no browser has implemented it yet. And there's no prototypes to try. So it's very, very experimental in terms of its concept. Um, but CSS would like to have something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So no awesome. partials yet. Got to use preprocessors mm. for that still. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's, that's fair. We are still getting to explore that. So um, preprocessor one on that round right <laughs> yep yeah yep <laughs> yes yeah so um i've been seeing around you know some functions right yes yes do you want to touch on those because i really do not know what they are really okay yeah yeah show off i'm just gonna make a little uh thing here all right let's make a color this one's gonna rotate to 100 um okay. let's see circle at bottom center in oklch wow we've got oh it's like it just didn't rotate the hue enough there yeah, we go it 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 reads like english that's um and of course you were showing off because you didn't even let me complete the old thought of showing functions you're just doing the things but I, that, i've got a lot of the gradient syntax memorized yeah <laughs> wow yeah Okay, so yeah, what were the functions you saw that you want to know about? Yeah, like just oh, that's off the nice. top of your head. Oh, that that that's beautiful. Wait, oh, that's good. That's good. So off the top of your head, um, I'm gonna hit you with a couple, but you could tell me some of your favorite ones. Mm. Mm hmm. Okay. I mean, the gradients, I, knowing how gradients work is so cool. You get to work with masks. Um, there's all sorts of tricks and things you can do with gradients that are really cool. So I love the gradient yeah. functions. But in terms of like new ones, mm -hmm. um, what is a good one? I mean, the clamp clamp is really nice. Uh, I use okay. that all the time. And the min and the max functions. Uh, the trigonometry functions are really nice for bringing uh, curved and radial interfaces onto the web so that everything's not just a straight stack you can kind of anyway you have arcs and stuff like that yeah um other interesting mm -hmm. um so i i did see i don't know the... yeah hit you some <laughs> yeah sure of course i i did uh, color see the mix. drop shadow is is that a thing oh yeah the yeah. filter yeah so that's yeah, like a sure. old school one from the filter days that one's mm -hmm. different from box shadow uh, uh filter oh. drop shadow will take the actual cutout shape of the element and make a shadow okay. from it, whereas box shadow uses the box size mm -hmm. to make a shadow. So that wow. one can be really nice if you've got a tool tip that's got like a little triangle, little dippy downy. Um, you can make the shadow the same shape, have the little little thing. Nice. That's awesome. That's cool. So um, I think we shouldn't go through all the functions because we could just go down the rabbit hole. But there's, there's this lot, buzz, yeah. yeah. There's this buzz about the. I've done. I've read up about it, but like, what does the dot has the colon has? 
um studio selector does that make it so because i've been seen on twitter this is a game changer and i'm like okay why and is there anything it does that sort of like have like a one-up on preprocessors sort of ish yeah so preprocessors have a in which css nesting got is kind of a concept mm -hmm. of parent Mm -hmm. It really, though, is just a selector that allows you to manage order. But selectors always end with the thing on the right, right? So okay. here, like, we'll make a selector here. We saw that mm. main paragraph. This yeah. was the same thing as if we did main paragraph. Mm -hmm. And it, we're selecting the P, the, the thing at the far right. And yes, there's a couple course. things that has does that's super awesome. One of them is if I do has p and mm -hmm. get rid of this part the selector is no longer the p the selector is it's... main oh wow so you get to you get to change this this is what i like to call and i think it's probably decently official verbiage is changing the subject of the selector so the has selector allows you to change the subject to something other than what's all the way on the right you can like still it. continue and select more stuff after but mm -hmm. it's, this would be first you're finding mains that have a paragraph and then finding all the paragraphs inside of there. This is kind of a dumb example, but uh, you can continue it on. So that's one mm -hmm. thing that it does that's very special. It changes this subject. It can also reach uh, way outside of itself. So you could have like HTML has uh, input with the ID of foo is checked. Mm -hmm. And then you can select your main element oh, so you can oh, wow. you can basically like hoist all sorts of state of your application up into the top and then deliver it back down to change state somewhere else so it's almost like yeah any element can change any other element on the page based on its state as long as a selector can select it um yeah so um, it has yeah that and there's all sorts of other powers so yeah people are building games with these because this checked well, feature here wow yeah yeah, that, that's that's interesting because I saw Adam Watham, the maker of Tailwind CSS, he did mention that a bunch of JavaScript code he had was made unnecessary because of the has selector. And that was like something that got me wondering, like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So before the has selector, this, um, like the example use of main and p, if you want to do that before, you have to use a fair bit of JavaScript. Yeah, you could have your server. So like a lot of times the server mm -hmm. would mark main as like, and it would have a class like has paragraphs. Oh, yeah. You know? So like your your template engine would do a lot of the work to be like, what's in this object? Does the object have a description? Then make sure to tell this card that there's a description in it so I can change the layout. Yeah. And now you can have oh. that all controlled by uh -huh. CSS, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because you know, yeah, that's where you have to dynamically add the classes yeah that's that's interesting okay so there's i also think that's got a stuff like this mm -hmm. yeah so you got has user invalid so now mm -hmm. you can target the form if any of the form inputs are invalid and then find all your errors and set them to display block so you've got like form errors are set to display wow. none mm -hmm. and then but if there are so, any errors in the form yeah find those errors and send them to display block. That's it, It's looking like JavaScript, but now it's all CSS because, you know, you're doing some conditional things, but now it's in, in the CSS layer, which is something I'm all up for because the less JavaScript, the better. This is amazing, really. Like, I've never saw has in that light because I know there was a lot of buzz about it. Even DHH from, from the Rails um, community was in love with it so another thing which i think is a little bit older so i'm just gonna like just let me see how much time we do have so we have like six minutes more but yeah i'm just gonna hit you with the things that uh, come up so i think like you did show me popovers and anchors do you want to do that like just go i can show again. you a little bit yeah here's a code pen i was working on recently about anchors. So this isn't going to be pop-ups. But we can go over anchoring really quick. Oh, I'm going to have to be in a different browser here. Okay. 
because this is canary only. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Still Pop-o- being walked on. Popovers are in Safari and Chrome, but not quite uh, Anchor yet. Mm-hmm. So we're still waiting okay. for both these things you mentioned to be stable across browsers. But mm-hmm. uh, let's see. I need to stop sharing and share a different okay. window here. Nope, that's the wrong one. <laughs> Better close that one so I stop sharing that one. Okay. This one we want. Share okay. screen. Is that one? No, it's not that one. Uh oh, it's gonna make me look. Wait, window? Yeah, this one. Okay. We're in business. Yeah, how's that? Yeah, okay, I like cool. it. So with uh CSS anchor, you have two kind of elements that need to play nice together. You have one thing that's like uh the base, you know, like mm-hmm. the um what you want to attach to. And then you have the follower. Uh, it's like I've shown here. It's like it's called the mm-hmm. follower. So something is following the position of something else. It's anchored to it. And the way that works is the H1 here. So that's what I'm anchoring to, like the title. It says, here's my anchor name. If anything okay. wants to attach to me or position based on me, you could reference me by name. My name is dash wow. dash H1. And you're like, cool, that's really easy. So this thing just basically defines itself and declares itself as an anchorable element. And mm-hmm. then the anchor itself, so this is like the tool tip or whatever it is, is position fixed and it's anchor default is saying, I want all of my anchor positioning to be based on H1. Let me pull this out wow. so we can see. And then uh, from here, I have a bunch of helpers here. So we can see that I've got classes. This is kind of like a tailwind style. You could have like anchor top yeah. center. Mm-hmm. So I've got the anchor that defines the the thing it's anchored to. And if it's top, I'm setting the inset block end to anchor start. This gets kind of confusing. But like mm-hmm. anchor start is the top of this element right here because it's its block start. So it's its logical side. And then I'm setting the block end of the tooltip to match that. So now the bottom of my tooltip matches the top of my element is basically what I've said here. And then it's also in the center. And that's kind of it. So anchoring is aware of the size of an element that it wants to attach to. It knows all of the sides and the the box size and the bounding areas. And it has all these keywords to allow you to like snap to these different sections. So like if I came here to the anchor and I said like uh, right center. Oh, it looks like CodePen's freaking out on me because it's too small a window. So I'll say like right center. Yeah. So now we'll be on the right of the element on the center. And the reason that we did Mm -hmm. that is because we went to the inline start and we anchored on the end with this one so the inline start of our tooltip to the end of our anchor destination and now they they're touching mm. anyway wow did that that's is that helpful yeah, and, <laughs> yeah it, it is and again for context you would have to do this with a fair bit of javascript before now and yeah. um, yes, yeah, like it, I think a lot. In fact, people pull in libraries for this stuff, right? Yeah, Popper. Um, there's all sorts mm-hmm. of them. Um, and I've written the JavaScript so many times. It's and it's frustrating, especially like when you get towards the edge. Like, look how this yes. one goes out of view. You can specify a way so that it would pop to the other side if it was better. Like top and bottom does that. So that as uh-huh. it gets to the top of the screen, it automatically goes to the bottom. So it's like it tries to stay in view. A lot of mm-hmm. the features that you would get in like Popper and stuff like that, we're trying to put into the platform so you don't need mm-hmm. JavaScript to just yeah. anchor something to something else. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think one of the features that I saw that was really interesting to me because at the time I am working on this um, part of the tool I'm building that um, is, is going to have invoice generation. So I was using text areas for it. And you, like, you know, text areas, they don't auto grow or it used to not auto grow. You have to do that with JavaScript, right? And it's sort of like, uh, yeah, like can't it just grow? Even text boxes, they don't auto grow now. But with what's new in CSS, when I saw the magic, I was like, oh, this is this is it. This is amazing. I just can't wait for you to get across all browsers because not having to write that JavaScript and to or at runtime do that where the the CSS engine can do that for you. I love it. Right, yep. so here's what we had before. It's mm-hmm. not growing. Here's one that does grow. Oh. 
grows in its width, its height. Ah, oh, isn't that it, nice? Ah, oh. it's just it's just so beautiful, really, to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and yeah, it's very and the same thing yeah like same thing with select boxes which is just OP and I think there's been so much advance like of newer things happening in CSS that I just feel like this is just amazing so we are I think we we're, we're at time but one more thing I okay two more questions I have for you before we call it I know you're having fun go on go on and uh-huh. anyway, enjoy uh-huh. it <laughs> <laughs> enjoy it. and. And of course, with the fast selection thing. So, what are your favorite? Because you know, maybe not field size. Like, what are your favorite CSS features today? And what CSS features are you looking forward to in the future? Because I think you have some insider secrets than we mortals on CSS world. Yes, we captured a lot of them here in this. So, me and uh, other members of my team came up with mm-hmm. this last year. So we. Last year, Spotify wrapped was all hot, and I was like, "Dang, CSS yes, needs a it was. needs a wrapped." And so this year, we delivered on a like a concept just like Spotify wrapped, but for CSS. This mm-hmm. has all sorts of cool stuff in here um, about what's new. We talk about it, give a lot of uh, examples. And if I had to say some of my favorite things out of here, um, I really enjoy nesting. Mm-hmm. Um, the trigonomic functions and the complex end selectors are super handy uh, for just building like modern things that handle your exceptions just very elegantly right there in CSS. The text wrap balance stuff is awesome. I love relative color syntax. Um, mm. And that one we're waiting on Firefox. And that is really cool. Has is incredible. Container yep. queries, style queries. But honestly, I've done so much with view transitions and the scroll driven animation stuff, just in terms of like making really desirable, interactive, visually stunning AP like interfaces view transitions and scroll driven animations are just here to do it. No JavaScript library. There are JavaScript APIs if you want them. And some of them like view transitions requires JavaScript in order to work, unless you're doing multi-page transitions, which aren't stable yet. And we could do a whole thing on that. But um, I'd say, yeah, the scroll driven animations, view transitions, has and nesting and relative color syntax are like my big favorites. Things I'm looking forward to is, um, oh, what do we got? like getting hacked on this year um i well even things that might not come i'd love to see the sibling index things so that okay. we can stagger animations and select things based on their their current index mm-hmm. um or at least use their index in a calculation or some other things that we're hoping for i'd like to see custom media so another thing that preprocessors can do that we can't do in uh native in the browser yet is stash a media query in a variable okay. right you can do that all the time you'd be like this is oh, our mobile yeah our mobile yeah, media yeah. query and it's like you know 320 pixels or whatever mm-hmm. um, and in css you can't stash that but there is a proposal and it's been in draft for four or five years or something called custom media and it allows you Ooh. to take a media query and put it Love in basically like a yeah custom media uh, yes. and put it in a property and and pass it around i'd love to see that because that would be another thing that like I'm only pre-processing about two or three things in my style sheets right now. One of them is custom media. Another okay. one is bundling so that I don't have the imports. And I'd have to go check my Dino mm. post CSS config for what's on my site. But I think that's pretty much it at this point. Oh, wow. That's that's dope. Like I think I'm going to link to this in the description. And I'm also going to check it out. And while you were glossing, I, in fact, I think we could spend another hour, which we won't on things like container queries and style queries and all the amazing niceness they they bring to CSS. Like even subgrade, right? Like I, oh, it's a yeah, lot. Right here. It's a lot. We we are not gonna we I'm just gonna link for you all. You'll go 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 read about those yourself. And even with the text wrap balance and uh oh, that's that's beautiful. Yeah, no. I'm gonna resist that, that temptation. So thank you. So yeah, I think you could stop sharing us. So I don't get tempted. Let's 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 um let's sure, exercise sure. some some discipline today. <laughs> so yeah, this has been fun. I I who knew for something that's not a programming language that is this much fun, hey? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe that's that's how you know it's a programming language. Are you having fun writing characters into a file and hitting save? Uh, is it mm-hmm. doing things that are exciting? I think the thing about programming languages is like, do you show it to your mom? And does your mom go, ew, code? It's probably a programming language. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So um, finally, before we wrap up, like, do you... um, So, you know, 
on Twitter, which is not a real place, it's like often <laughs> <laughs> people will come in like with the memes and everything. We'd be like, no one can master CSS, you know, CSS is hard and all that stuff. But you seem to, you know, be doing pretty, pretty well. You know, you've been doing this for like, you know, a long time. But in, from your experience, like, could you just, your methodology for really ad, like knowing this tool called CSS, like for newer devs or developers that want to, that are still writing to CSS files that don't want to do Tailwind things, how do they like get better, you know, to like, because I, I'm pretty sure that a large percentage of people will still be doing things the old way using javascript and everything like how do they like get better like stay on top of css you know and actually get better at it and not um see it as this hard thing to conquer yeah um one of the main things is i think it helps to have a goal that you're working towards mm -hmm. this is like a you know if you want to learn how to build websites with a framework then go build a website with the framework, right? It's like, you can't quite just take little pieces here and there. But with CSS, I think what you can do is focus on um, elements of polish that are really interesting to you. And you can think about this like a, there's two different t t kinds of tables you can have in your living room. There's like a, a table that was like obviously cut by a machine into squares and they put some legs on it and they said, here, it's a table. And you're like, yes, yeah, that table, I can use it. But then there's other tables where you're like the edges, have really nice smoothing on them. The corners mm -hmm. have smoothing. There's like ingrained uh, different insets, different designs that are on there. And yeah. so as like a person looking at these two tables, you can choose what your focus. Do you want to focus on using machines to build tables or do you want to learn how to do all the insets and stuff like that? And so if you focus on a couple of the cool features that you see in some interfaces, like in some UI, you're like, I really liked the colors. I really liked the gradients. Uh, I really liked the way the hover interaction was. I really liked the way that that form presented errors to me. Yeah. I would say go and rebuild it and f and find that inspiration and work yourself through all the different steps that it takes to get that, uh, to reach that level of quality that you're looking for and then move on to the next thing. And as you continue building high quality interfaces that you're spending a lot of time on the little details, all the little details will stick to you and they'll travel with you through all your future projects. And you'll just kind of snowball and gain skills and get better and better um, through these kind of like realistic things, I think is the best way to, to do it. Yeah, I think I totally agree. Like the best way to, to learn how to code is to just code. The best way to learn CSS is to do enough CSS, like the ones you see, the ones you like, try to replicate them as much time as possible. And, you know, it's it will just come it will just um compound for you and before you know you're you're better at css thank you so much that's been nice. amazing yeah for sure of course so, yeah one, one last thing how where can folks reach out to you i know you on x or twitter um are they another place like you know like you hang out and talk about css all day uh, I mean, I'm on Mastodon as well. And front end at social, you see me with the same handle, Argyle Inc. I'm on Blue Sky. I'd say follow my RSS or follow my Twitter feed where I'm just constantly sharing inspirational things that have to do with web UI. And so you'll naturally be kind of getting a wash of um, different properties, different techniques. And mm -hmm. as you see them, you can study them and hopefully find a way to use them inside of your projects. Yeah, awesome. So... Uh, as lastly, as a as my teacher, you always have the right to plug anything. So, do you want to plug anything? Are we looking out for something like whatever it is? Just let us know, like what you want to share or what you want us to do. Sure, mm. I've got a couple podcasts that are pretty. If you're into podcasts, check out the CSS podcast. That's an official Google one where you and I and I mm. break down CSS and how it's actually a programming language and really dig into the nitty gritty details of like the spec side of CSS. And then I have okay. another podcast that's unofficial Google one called the bad at CSS podcast. I do that one with David East and mm -hmm. we kind of bring guests on or we ourselves talk about things that we're bad at in CSS and by explaining it to each other and working through the details, um, you can learn about CSS um, through our failures. So one is very, <laughs> very scholastic and the other one is much sillier um and pick a pick a style how you want to learn css there's a couple good podcasts for you definitely i think i should i did try listening to one 
Um, I think it's the official one from Google DCSS podcast. And I, I, I sort of got lost. I was like, okay, you all were having fun, but I wasn't like, I'm like, am I in the wrong room? But I'm, I'm going to try again. <laughs> <laughs> I try to like, because I feel as a web dev, it, it, it doesn't hurt to like, be well-rounded, understand these things. Maybe, like I said, I, I, I really write a .css file, but understanding how Tailwind really works, because Tailwind just gives you all the CSS. At the end of the day, it's, ju- it's going to generate a .css file for you, but it's just going to let you understand it some more. So yeah, thank you. I'm going to link to all the podcast things. And yeah, this has been amazing. This was so much fun. I think this might be like the uh, the, the most the session i've laughed the most on because it was just easy. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so you you've won the record of that so thank you so much for your time adam and um yeah thank you so much for coming of course thanks for inviting me we'll see you around on the web